Welcome to the show. Blimey. Where to begin? Uh, the Labour Party's been plunged into chaos uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, I suppose the most recent reason is that the leader of the Labour Party and his team have tri- had sacked the party chair, the deputy leader, Angela Rayner, in an attempt to scapegoat her for the disastrous failings of Keir Starmer and his team in the elections this week. Uh, they also have the ice pick out for various other people, though it's not entirely sure where this so-called reshuffle now is because of the chaos that has enveloped uh, Labour's top operation. Uh, now, we've got a very stellar lineup today to talk about, I think, what is a pretty big moment in Labour history. I think this is a what on the verge of some sort of turning point about where uh, the Labour Party goes, about the battle for the soul, the heart and soul of a party that was founded 120 years ago to represent the interests of working people in this country. Now, of course, we saw last week the terrible results in Hartlepool, a a, a seat which, of course, was held by the Labour Party under its predecessor, Keir Starmer's predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn, twice. It's not, it's less than four years ago when over half of the electorate in Hartlepool voted for the Labour Party, even though back in 2015, it was a more marginal seat for the Labour Party than it was in 2019, when less people... Uh, voted for the Brexit party in 2019 than had voted for UKIP in 2015. And yet, of course, Labour managed to take that vote, or much of it, in 2017. This time round, not only did Labour lose votes to other parties, but their own vote collapsed as Labour voters did not come out uh, to vote in Hartlepool. We've seen uh, across the country, of course, uh, Labour losing council seats. But there have been positives, which we're also going to talk about, because I think there are lessons to be learned, not least in Wales under the leadership of Mark Drakeford, but also, uh, for example, Andy Burnham in Manchester, Sadiq Khan in London, uh, and local examples like Salford and Preston, where Labour parties with radical leaderships and radical policies, which actually give an incentive for people to vote for them, They've booked a national trend, which is why at the end of the programme, we'll be joined by the leader of Preston City Council, Councillor Matthew Brown, who will tell us about what they've been doing in Preston and the lessons that can be learned. But meanwhile, um, is a febrile uh, period in Labour history, as I've said. Uh, At the moment, we have, uh, I've been told, Peter Mandelson is essentially calling the shots in the Labour Party in 2021. Uh, Shadow cabinet ministers who complained about dire uh, messages, lines to take to the media after the rout in Harleypool. Uh, uh, when they complained, uh, he told uh, they were told that those lines had been sol- signed off by Peter Mandelson, of course, the former Labour MP for Peter Man- uh, for Hartlepool, but uh, otherwise known uh, as the Prince of Darkness because, of course, uh, his role as a spinner. Uh, he's been playing an absolute critical role in the strategy and direction of Keir Starmer's leadership we've seen what the results have been. Now, before I bring in our first, we're very delighted, of course, to have John McDonnell to kick things off uh, with his uh, his brilliant insight as ever. Uh, but before we do, uh, I think it's worth remembering, Keir Starmer was elected with a decisive mandate. He won a thumping. I didn't vote for him, but I respected the mandate at the beginning, uh, showed goodwill. People can read the column I wrote when he became leader of the Labour Party. And he won uh, that vote on the basis of maintaining the core radical policies of the Corbyn era, increasing taxes on the rich, increasing corporation tax to fund investment in this country, uh, to scrap tuition fees so young people aren't saddled with debt for daring to dream for a university education, common ownership, a green industrial revolution, uh, uh, no more uh, illegal wars, defence of migrants. We could go on. It was it was core radical policies from the Corbyn era. Now, of course, a few weeks ago, we had, and I keep saying this, but the grotesque chaos of a Labour opposition, a Labour opposition scuttling its spokespeople around TV studios to oppose a Tory chancellor hiking corporation tax, quite literally out uh, outmaneuvering the Tories on economic policy from the right. Uh, and given the Labour right are on manoeuvres at the moment, I do think it's worth them asking, what do they stand for? What's their vision? Because I think their cupboard is completely empty and bare. They have nothing to say about the problems facing this country. Uh, in a period of crisis and instead of just trying to reheat solutions from a different historical era. That's my spiel. Uh, Before I bring in John, uh, just quickly, uh, a bit of housekeeping. If you're not watching live, click on the YouTube link. Uh, It really helps if you watch on YouTube, uh, helps the show. Click like and subscribe. Uh, For those supporting us on Patreon, you make this channel possible. The documentary we just did with our superb team uh, up in Hartlepool, which... uh, 
got a deserved praise, not because of me, but because of the skill of the people that your money funds. So thank you so much on Patreon forward slash Owen Jones 84. Do check out the Hartley Pool documentary. Um, and and I, I hope you'll see why it was praised. You can also support the channel and its team using Super Chat. And if you press Super Chat, you get on YouTube. You have to come through to YouTube. You can put questions to our guests as well. Right. That's enough of me. Uh, and I, oh, Joe, I will re I will read out everyone who does that at the end to give you a thanks at the end of the show. We're going to start with John McDonald. Let's bring in John. Big honour to see you, John, as ever. How are you doing? Very good. I don't know about this honour bit, but it's good to see you all, mate. Yeah, it's always good. an honour. Always an honour. Uh, my old boss, I should say. But, John, like, let, let's just kick off the elections. Let's just start with the election results. Mm -hmm. What's your, what, what would you, how would you understand the election results that took place last week? What happened? There's very difficult to get one comprehensive view. So let's take it bit by bit. The point that you made is where we have Labour incumbents who are pursuing, I think, to be honest, sometimes quite radical, other times fairly straightforward social democratic stroke socialist policies. They're being rewarded with actually, in most instances, increased majorities. So the lesson there is if you get elected in this country and you develop and implement those policies and you also actually you have a bit of courage in your hands as well and oppose a Tory government, you get rewarded. People respect you for it. And if you look at the increased majorities that Stevie Rotherham has got, Andy Burnham, um, Sadiq uh, didn't get an increased majority, but it was a solid majority. Look at look at um, Salford Mayor there. It was unbelievable. So I think the message there is when people know what you stand for and you're standing for policies that actually will improve working class lives, you'll get you'll get the loyalty where there are elections, um, particularly under local council elections, where often you will get people campaigning locally who have got a bit of a reputation. But usually you're swamped by the national party politics on the doorstep. And if that the party politics is such that, for example, in terms of the Labour Party, there was no other message for the last 12 months other than the slogan under new leadership. After that, there was no vision, no policy. And I kept saying yesterday, you know, our candidates were sent out virtually naked into the campaign without policy that they could advocate. So there, to be honest, we got absolutely hammered in many instances. And you can see why, because people, well, they just didn't know what we stood for. There was obviously in some areas the Brexit hangover, and we've got to come to terms with that. I um, mean, in places like Hartlepool as well, I tell you, having Peter Mandelson touring round in Hartlepool was a, a just such a mistake. Peter Mandelson symbolises everything that people were complaining about under Labour and Labour MPs in places like that, which was they were taken for granted. You know, Peter Mandelson was parachuted into Hartlepool. He had no connection. I doubt if he knew where the place was, to be honest. And that apocryphal story about, you know, most probably is not true, but where he, when he mistake mushy peas for guacamole, you know, it just symbolises everything about that style of new Labour politics. And if you look at the long trend over that 20 years, you can see where working class votes were moving again away from us in those particular areas. Because, to be honest, people just thought we were, they were being taken for granted. It was very similar to the scene in Scotland as well. So all those factors came together. Lack of campaign, lack of vision, lack of policy, and uh, also a bit of a history, plus the Brexit hangover. And also you, have to, you do have to take into account the COVID issue where when you've got a national crisis like that, it's fairly natural to, to support the um, government in place, and particularly as Boris Johnson was stealing of the work of the NHS workers in the fantastic rollout of the vaccination. All those factors came together. And in normal circumstances, you know, we'd be sitting down, analysing all those and having a proper democratic debate within the Labour movement and seeing where we go next. Instead, what we get is Keir Starmer on the Friday doing a car crash interview, I have to say, where he says, I'll take, it's my responsibility, I'll take responsibility, I'll, it's down to me, I'll be there, I'll take all full responsibility for this. And then within 24 hours, he's sacking Angie Rayner, as a, basically scapegoating her for the, the loss of Hartlepool in particular. 
I don't carry any brief for Andrew Rayner. I didn't vote for him. I voted for Richard Bergen as deputy leader. But what you don't do as a leader, and Jeremy never did this, neither did I. What you don't do as a leader, when you've when something's gone wrong, you take it, you own it, you take it on the chin. That's what leadership is all about. So I'm, I just, I don't know. I, I was pretty angry yesterday, especially when the results were coming in, where we were having our successes like Preston, like Manchester, Liverpool, Salford, Bristol, London, and West of England. So some, as I said earlier, to one discussion we had, you know, what PR genius thought up having a reshuffle story of sacking Andy Urena just when we were getting some good news. Disastrous. Uh, I mean, Peter Donovan asked, do you think Angela Rayner was always going to get the chop at some point? I suppose with Andy Rayner, what message do you think this sends to people who voted for Keir Starmer based on the prospectus that he laid out a year ago, yeah. which was party unity and to maintain the radical policies of the Corbyn era? Was that a false prospectus? Well, look, for 12 months, look, for 12 months, I've been loyally um, trying to be as constructive as I possibly could. I, When Jeremy and I stood down, I've said this time and time again, I, I took the view that what shouldn't happen, we shouldn't in any way do or encourage what happened to, to, to Keir, what happened to Jeremy. When Jeremy took over the leadership, the Parliamentary Labour Party, large elements of it, were undermining him from day one. And if you remember, let's go back to Peter Mandelson. Can you remember that interview he did where he said, I'll wake up every morning and, tr and work on the base of a new idea to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn? And that's what a number of them did. And I said to Jeremy then that we must never do that. We'll stand down and we'll give him a fair crack of the whip. He's been democratically elected. He said he's going to unite the party. He said he's standing on a 10-point plan, which is largely based upon the what he called a foundational document, the 2019 manifesto. So let's give him his chance. And I've I've held to that. I've held to that. Uh, I've had some crap from um, trolling on on um, Twitter and elsewhere because of that. I've taken some shit over that. But I thought it was the right thing to do. But after 12 months, you cannot run a leadership on a simple slogan under new leadership and then not even define what that means. And then with Angie Rayner, as I say, I haven't hold no brief for her, but everyone knows the way Keir runs the ship is very centralised. He has a number of apparatchiks around him and they run the show. That's the point that you made. Nothing goes out unless it's been signed off. No one's allowed to appear on TV, media, broadcast, issue a press statement unless it's been cleared, largely drafted by the leader's office. So if you've got running that sort of centralised control, well, I'm afraid you take the responsibility for when things go right and for when things go wrong. Simple as that. And then with Angie Rayner, I, doubt, I don't know what sort of control that she had, but she wouldn't have been allowed to set outside the parameters that um, Keir and his team, a uh, tight team of apparatchiks set, really. So on that basis, I think this is just a scapegoating exercise. Blame anyone else apart from yourself. It looks as though this sh um, reshuffle, which is, again, it's just been suspended, I hear, for the time being. But it's the same with the others that he's targeting at the moment. Most of them, have, uh, they've been told, you know, maybe they're going because they're not performing or whatever. I don't think half of them have been allowed to perform because there's such tight control of the resources as well. I think, I don't know, you, you pick, we made mistakes when we were in the leadership. Of course we did, and you learn from those mistakes. And one of the things that you do, and one of the things that Jeremy really built amongst the whole team that we had really was you work cooperatively together. And when you win, you celebrate together. And when you lose, you hold together. And that, unfortunately, that lesson hasn't been learned by Keir and his team. Uh, I mean, we mentioned Peter Mandelson. Um, as I said, I've been told that shadow cabinet ministers, when they complained about the lines that they were expected to take to the media for the Hartlepool route, uh, were told that those lines had been signed off by Peter Mandelson. He's also publicly declared, and I quote, that the hard left factions attached to trade unions have to go, and what he describes as party reform, which I think others might describe as a mass purge, should be a priority for Starmer. What do you think the significance of Peter Mandelson's role is, and where do you think, given what's likely to happen, a lot of people associated with the so-called soft left look like to be demoted, 
in favour of figures on the on the hard right of the Labour Party. I mean, what's that telling us? Twelve months ago, the point that you made, Keir stood on a ticket of uniting the party. If Mandelson is playing this role and all the evidence is pointing towards it, he's possibly the, the appointed the most divisive figure in the history of the Labour Party over the, well, for a generation at least. Some people may remember that his attitude towards the left and the campaign group in particular was that the sealed tomb, he was going to seal us in a tomb so that we would never ever have any role to play or influence in the party itself. He hasn't given up on that objective. That's what this is all about. And if if Keir is listening to him and following a strategy as developed by Peter Mandelson, it means this is going to be the biggest attack on, on the left that we've seen in almost probably in all our membership, the Labour Party. And I've been a member over 45 years. And it will be um, the way in which we've seen, I suppose, the traditional purges as well. But also, I think it will drive the party itself back into the hands of capital, because that's what was happening under Mandelson and others. The, when I took over as the shadow chancellor, I took over and um, from the previous shadow chancellor, and there were there, there were a whole range of advisors, and they were all they were largely funded from the from the big um, accountancy firms and places like that. And I can remember during the 1990s, even when New Labour took over after John Smith's death. I used to be as a lay member on a whole range of these working groups developing policy. Then all of a sudden, things changed. There was no longer party members. It was a number of private company representatives, basically. And they were the people developing ideas like the private finance initiative that when we went into government, they made vast profits over. So I, I think this is the point that you made. Earlier, I think this is a really dangerous moment for the party. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful as ordinary party members, we'll lose our own party. So my view now is meaning to recognise the danger that there is, make sure Keir knows we know this uh, the, the direction that Mandelson will push this party in, and we've got to start organising on the left, definitely. And as I say, I've done everything I can over the last 12 months. I've, I've you know, I'm, I've, I've come under criticism from various people because I, I haven't been attacking Keir or anything like that. Well, I deliberately haven't. I deliberately wanted to give him his chance on the basis of the promises he gave upon which he was elected. Unite the party. Here's the 10-point plan based upon the last manifesto that naturally you'd want to develop and actually, I think, make more radical. But that isn't what's happened. And I think a lot of people will feel well, quite betrayed, to be honest. A lot of people who voted for him will think, I voted for Keir Starmer. I didn't vote for Peter Mandelson didn't vote for this potential attack on the left and the undermining of our party. Finally on that, where do you think this goes next? What should the left do? But also, I mean, do you think this could end up in a full-scale leadership crisis, including a leadership contest? There have been murmurings of this uh, amongst some Labour MPs. There's already growing discontent, not confined to the left, I must say, even before uh, the Hartlepool route. Some might say that if Keir Starmer wants to stand on a different mandate than he got elected democratically, then he needs to put that to the Labour membership if he's doing the exact opposite of what he promised. So what should the left do? Is there going to be a leadership contest or leadership crisis that leads to that, do you think? First step is this. Um, I think it behoves us. It's our responsibility now. And the point that you made, this isn't just members of the campaign group in Parliament. These are people right the way across the party. Um, you know, people who thought they were part of quite a broad coalition are now waking up to the fact that actually there's a small coterie, a cabal, if you like, that are trying to take over the party, using Keir as the front for this, and to drag us to well, quite a right-wing reactionary positions that we thought we'd never, ever see this party adopt again. So I think the first step that we have a responsibility is to get the message into Keir, that actually, you know, the Labour Party was founded on the basis of people coming together through solidarity and that we, that part of that solidarity was a recognition that when is someone is democratically elected, we give them our support and loyalty. But when that is, that is betrayed, I think the message needs to go into gear. Actually, you're straining at the very ethos, the very values of solidarity 
that we found our party on and that you're going beyond anything that you were elected for and that we're not going to we're not going to let that happen and if it, if we have to fight it we'll fight it in every branch in every trade union in every meeting at every conference and i'm not into leadership coups or anything like that that's not the way we go about it i'm not into all of that i believe that what we've got to do is win the battle of ideas and yes if necessary at different times the battle of elected position as well but the first step is to explain to Keir just how serious this is. And I think, I hope he wait, and those people around him wake up to it because disunited parties don't win elections. If we'd have had a united party behind us in 2017, if we hadn't had the Peter Mandelsons trying to undermine Jeremy every day, as he put it, and others win the Parliamentary Labour Party, we'd be in government now. We'd be in the third into the fourth year of a Labour government where we'd have funded the NHS properly so we could deal with COVID. We would have had a national social care service as well. And we would have had, you know, levels of investment which have been made to ensure that we would not have children living in poverty at the moment the way they are. That's what they did to us. Now, the key issue for us now is to get across to Kia and all those around him, what they're putting at risk completely unnecessarily. But if they want to fight, I'm up for it. John, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I can see from the comments that that message has been uh, taken in a very appreciative way by people watching. So thank you so much for joining. And uh, we'll see, see how this unfolds in the coming days. I'll speak to you soon. Uh, brilliant stuff. Um, I think I can see that's fired people up which is, I think, important given the juncture we're currently at. Now, I'm going to bring in, again, very lucky to have such a, an astonishingly uh, brilliant lineup today. So I'm going to bring in now John Trickett, who, of course, uh, formerly in the Shadow Cabinet, not just of Jeremy Corbyn, but actually Ned Miliband, very much a long-standing senior figure in the Labour Party, going back a very, very long way since he was first elected, I think, 1996 in a by-election. That's true, yeah, that's true, yeah, yeah. Right. John, great to see you. How are you doing? Great to see you. I hope you're well. Uh, where to begin? <laughs> OK, let's just start with what's your interpretation of the election results this week? Well, first of all, the election results are obviously uh, very difficult for us. I would have thought our first task is wait till all the votes have been counted. They haven't all yet been counted. Analyse what happened and then figure out a way forward. Because, look, the first task of the Labour Party, I mean, I'd like to see move towards socialism, but our first task, is to show that we can defeat the Tories. And that is the primary task which we give to the leader when we elect him or her. And I'm afraid uh, by that measure, um, well, he has uh, not achieved uh, that. What's striking about those election results, though, where there was a Labour figure but who wasn't here, then we seem to win the elections. Think about it. We won in Wales with Mark Drakeford. We won in Manchester with Andy. We won in Liverpool, uh, Bristol. Wherever there was a figure who represented Labour as we know it, we won the election, other than when the figure was Keir Starmer. So I think, you know, I think he owes it to us to come out from wherever he's locked up and give an explanation as to what happened, how we can explain it. Because not only did we lose working class voters, and we've been doing that for some time, as you and I have discussed many times, Owen, but we've now lost a radical element, you might call it the Corbyn generation, who are going off to the Greens. Uh, the Greens, I think, tripled the vote, and uh, it's quite striking. Now, they, would, uh, they ought to be Labour voters, and they were in 2019, 2017. So... Look, I think it's a, it's not an absolute disaster because, as I say, if you look at Manchester or Wales, there are uh, glimmerings of um, hope, but we are in a very difficult position and there should be a proper post-mortem, never mind an attempt to divert attention by launching an attack on a working-class woman like Angie Rayner. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what you think the significance, what's driving what's happened with Angie Rayner. I mean... Superficially, it just looks like an attempt to scapegoat yeah. uh, the deputy leader, a, work, a working class northern woman who, who literally yeah. grew up around the corner from where I grew up. In fact, yeah. Uh, yeah. so maybe I feel a bit defensive about her for that reason, if that uh, alone. But what, what's the significance of that? And I, um, how do you think that will play with 
some of your Labour MPs who maybe aren't associated with the Corbyn left of the Labour Party? Well, let me just uh, try to give you the big picture as I see it first. Look, I didn't vote for Keir. I was the campaign chair, actually, for Becky, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think John, um, John Mack just said the same thing. One wanted to give him time and space to develop uh, his agenda. After all, the party had voted for him. But the first thing he did was to ring me up and sack me, and then he and Lavery, and then he sat Becky, and then he removed J uh, Jeremy uh, from the party, though I was negotiating with, with the office to try to reinstate Jeremy, and we were betrayed in those private conversations. Uh, so he attacked the left, and then he's now moving to the center left. That's how I see it. But look, here's a funny thing. Because isn't the job of the Labour leader to attack the Tories? But can you tell me one instance when Keir asked for a resignation or demanded the resignation of a senior cabinet minister? It starts off with Cummings, who does that disgraceful uh, venture up north, which undermined the national unity about COVID. Uh, he hasn't d uh, demanded the uh, removal of Williamson or Hancock. He hasn't asked for... Johnson to be sacked. What he's done is he sacked our friends, our comrades and our colleagues. And therefore, I think that tells you a lot. Why is it that a Labour leader should spend more of his time looking behind him and trying to remove people who w want the party to do well, whilst not asking for the removal or seeking the removal of senior cabinet ministers who are not only incompetent to the highest degree, but we have to say there's an element of corruption, political corruption at least, uh, in this uh, Tory government. But yet somehow we don't seem to be focusing on that. Now, I think this latest thing, attempt to remove the soft left, tells you just exactly where Keir is going. I'm not quite sure uh, about what John said, that he's listening purely to Mandelson, and Mandelson's the problem, though Mandelson clearly is a problem. It seems to me it's the direction that we set, the direction of travel that we set almost from day one when uh, I received that phone call from, uh, from although I expected it, to say we don't need your services anymore, John. Mm, indeed. Um, I, mean, I mean, it is interesting as well because you were removed from, you, you know, you're someone from what's been described as the so-called red wall. Ian Lavery was also replaced. I mean, we can see it as well. Sure. Andy Rayner. A northern Becky, Becky, Becky. I mean, it Becky. doesn't. Lot, it, lot. Starts have, it starts to have. Have you noticed the people who are being talked about who are going to be promoted? Look, look I'm not here to attack comrades, but look at the well. Let's call it the demographics of the people who look like they're going to be um, promoted. I mean, look. I mean, left and right is important, but social origin, geographic origin, you know, background, they all count as well. And uh, it's quite disturbing. Gender's an, an issue. Uh, we've, we've seen a number of women being suggested that they're going to be removed. All of that is kind of, it leaves a feeling that the leadership from the beginning was won on a deceitful promise, but knowing that they were intending from the beginning to begin to remake the Labour Party. However, I've got a message for them that is not going to happen very easily because our party members are deeply embedded and have a clear view of what's happened. They know that we, uh, Jeremy was pushed into a position by Keir uh, before the election, which made it very difficult to win the election. And they've seen what's happened since. I believe the party is with us. Now, there may be people watching now, uh, us talking, Owen, <laughs> I don't know if there are, but there may be people who are on the left who uh, left the party I don't know. I'd say that was a mistake. But look, there's fight in the old dog yet. Get back in the party because this is not over. We need all the forces we can to join the battle for a transformative Labour Party. And I still remain convinced we can win. Well, indeed, I mean, we've got comments, from example, Fridge Freezer. Is it too late to sign up to vote in the assumed upcoming leadership election. I will come on to that. In terms of, <laughs> look, I, I, like yourself, I, I, I voted for Becky Long-Bailey, but she was defeated. Lots of people yeah. who voted for Jeremy Corbyn in both leadership elections then voted for Keir Starmer. They were attracted by his yeah. promise of safeguarding the radical policies, uh, domestic policies of the Corbyn era, unity, competence, 
electability. Now, what would you say to those, many of those people who, who voted in good faith? They voted in good faith for yeah, that platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that essentially a political fraud by people around Keir Starmer, many of whom were involved in Liz Kendall, the Blair Act candidate's campaign, in 2015, they learned from that mistake because then they got four and a half percent in that leadership election. This yeah. time around, they went, where's the center of gravity in the leadership, in the, in the membership? Yeah. And it was on those sorts of policies. And that's how they won. Basically, I'm asking, are you to say to those people, was this a fraud? Is this based on a lie? I think, I think uh, it looks to me as though it was a fraud. I mean, one doesn't quite know what uh, somebody thinks in the privacy of their own uh, home, but from day one when he sacked us and, and then began to build a shadow cabinet which increasingly looked as though those of us uh, like me were being removed uh, the socialists but also people who'd argued for a better more progressive position on brexit than the one that was imposed on, on the party he looked from the beginning as though we were targets and i think he looked for a moment to take becky out and it was a false really uh, move that he took but look, here's the big picture really about Keir. I mean, I've had the chance to see him close up, uh, very close up. I mean, I think he lacks basic political skills. I mean, political skills required to be able to uh, give a vision and win that vision in the country, frame an argument and to build a consensus. That means being able to be able to express yourself to have ideas and to be able to even sometimes to bend and, and budge, compromise a little bit to win the argument. Look, I think it seems to me now, looking at him closely, he learned only the habit of command and control when he was at the DPP rather than the political skills. So I think, yeah, there's an underlying ideological position that uh, people around him have got, but it's also a question of whether he has the political skills uh, actually to be a leader. I think all of that matters now to those people who voted for Kia, thinking we can get, I mean, this is a, an awful phrase because Jim is a friend of mine, but Corbynism without Corbyn. I mean, I have no wish to fall out with anybody who took that decision. It seemed to me uh, it was a position which they took, and I decided to kind of be loyal uh, because that was the views of the party members. But I think that they will now feel that they were uh, cheated by promises which it looks like they never really believed in. And of course, he surrounded himself by people, as it appears now, who are quite right-wing ideologues. In fact, I think they're putting right-wing ideology in front of electability. That's really where we are. Now, we never did that. The le you, oh, and you know that. We always worked out how we could defeat the Tories. That was our first duty, even if sometimes we had to swallow hard. These people seem to think actually driving the left out of the party, maybe changing the union link as well, is more important than the principle of getting rid of the Tories. Well, I mean, on that, uh, for example, I'll just bring it up. Peter, Peter Mandelson has been openly briefing, basically calling for a mass purge of the left. Uh, he said that the hard left actions attached to trade unions have got to go and called for party reform, in reverted quotes, to be a priority. I think we know what part. He's using reform in the way people use reform of public services, which means cutting and privatising them. What, I mean, what, what does this not mean an all-out attack on the left beckons? And if so, what to do about that? Well, I think, I don't know what they've got in mind, but it doesn't look very healthy. I mean, I think uh, John Mack was just saying party unity is an important uh, thing to achieve. Of course it is, but as long as it's not unprincipled. And I think we have to stand by our principles. I mean, the reason why uh, I joined the Labour Party, by the way, in 1969, so well over 50 years now, was because the, un the unions and the party had an organic link together. And it seemed to me it was quite important that you had a party which had a working class base which the unions uh, gave us. Now, I think it looks to me as though they want to break the link or they're going to try to break the link. As I can't, it's hard to interpret it in any other way, Mandelson's words from this morning. But I just say this in the quietest possible way I can. In order to do that, you have to get through conference. And the conference uh, remain, you have to change the rules of conference, as you know, in that is not an easy to achievement if you're trying to take on the trade unions. So, in the end, I'm not sure they're going to be able to achieve that. 
But my sort of my thing now is I want to hear. I'd like. I, well, first of all, I'd like to see Keir out there in the full light of day. Tell us how he interprets what happened, what his role was and his responsibility was, and why he's doing this reshuffle and explain his actions. But secondly, I want to hear from the more important people, which are the members, the trade unionists and the party members, of whom there are still hundreds of thousands of people. I want to hear what they think should happen next and see where we take it. But I'm clear in my mind, the membership of both the unions and the party, those people are engaged want to see a transformational Labour government and a, and a party which reflects those views and they want to see Jeremy back, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, finally, where next, I suppose? Um, yeah. Because, I mean, is is it, do you think, possible or conceivable that Keir Starmer's leadership could, I suppose, change course to uh, where it, what, what it promised in the leadership election, uh, which is 10 pledges, unity, and all those things. Um, and if not, in a sense, has he voided his mandate? Because if you stand, I mean, that's the other problem as well, which is for any politician is uh, it, it's very hard in this country for a politician to be seen as to, to gain a reputation for honesty. But it's yeah. very easy to lose it and never get it back. And if you're seen as someone who says one thing to one electorate, which you don't mean at all, simply in order to get elected, then why on earth would anybody ever trust you to keep any of your promises when you go out to the wider electorate to make promises about what you'll do in power? So I suppose my question is, is this salvageable or is the Labour Party heading for a leadership contest? Well, let me take the, the first part of the question first and I will, I will uh, answer to the other. I mean, everybody knows, I think everybody in the country knows that Kia was for uh rejecting the original referendum he wanted us to remain of course he was cunning of course he shifted from one position position to another uh, tactically about how to achieve his ultimate objective and clearly the second referendum idea which had some appeal I, i'm not going to dismiss that there are people watching this today who felt that was the right way to go but he wanted to uh, rig the referendum in such a way that the party would have had to argue for remain and that would have been seen as a breach of faith. But look, that is his history. But what is it? I think it's important to the question you just raised is he becomes leader. And what did you say about Brexit? He said it's done. It's done. But of course, it isn't done in anybody's mind. You know, just to say that, uh, you know, something's been achieved doesn't make it happen in real life. And I think people do think that he shifted his position, that he might have been better to, even though I didn't agree with it, to stay where he was than to somehow pretended suddenly come to accept Brexit. And case that's a small example, but it's very important to voters around where I live. But then the bigger question you've just read about his commitments to the Labour Party. Oh, he had these 10 points. I thought they were not brilliant, actually, personally. I I'm more radical than that. But they were, uh, they were um, a sign that he wanted to uh, be centre-left, you know. And then I think all of them have been abandoned one by one. So people have formed a view about him, I think, that he's not trustworthy. I want to, as I just said, I want to hear the what the members' um, views are now. If it comes to the question as uh, ought there to be a leadership challenge, I don't think we should rule it out. I don't think we should rule it out for several reasons, but perhaps the most important is the one that you've just touched on: that a leader who has won the votes on the back of promises which then were reneged on, some of them quite quickly, ne needs to come clean and. So I want to hear what he says. I want to hear what the party membership says. But I think we should be prepared um, for further developments. Now, there is a probable new uh, by-election coming up in Batley soon. Batley isn't um, Hartlepool. It's uh, in my the wonderful part of the world where I live, West Yorkshire. It's a West Riding town. Um, that may only be weeks away now, a few weeks away, a by-election. Let's see where we get to in relation uh, to that. But suppose my final point is this, let the constituency parties meet. I know some of them are already uh, talking about votes of no confidence. Let's see what they're saying, um, because I, don't, I do believe in leadership, but I also believe in listening to the people who you want to lead. That is the next voice I want to hear after we, if, if Keir ever gets out of his darkened room where he is at the moment. 
Cheers for that, John. I mean, there's over 4,000 people watching this live and will be watching and listening later on uh, to what you said with a huge amount of interest. And Thank you very really, much. Really, really appreciate taking your time. Uh, and we'll see what happens in the coming days and weeks, which you will play, no doubt, a very big role in. But well, cheers, really <laughs> Good to see you, Owen. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. We'll, see, we'll see each other in real life over a pint soon. We'll, 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 maybe. <laughs> maybe. All right. Cheers, John. Take care. Cheers, bye-bye. 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 Uh, as I said, a huge amount of interest. We've got some super chats, which I will go through later, I promise. I'm very honoured now to be joined by a really brilliant new, newly elected, I suppose. It feels, I've lost track of all time. I suppose it's not, it's quite a while away now, the 2019 election. But nonetheless, a fantastic MP, a long-standing trade unionist, Kim Johnson. Let's bring Kim in. Hello, Kim. How are you? Good afternoon, Owen. I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me onto your show. It is a big, big honour. So I want to first ask about Angela Rayner, because, of course, you were the uh, PPS, for those who don't know. That's uh, a Labour MP who is the uh, the political personal... Wait a minute. Excuse me, I can't private remember the acronym. Personal, yeah, secretary. Personal, a, private a, secretary. personal private secretary. You'd think after working politics uh, for a long time, I should probably know that now. Uh, mm. So I just want your reaction to what we saw last night, which was, of course, the sacking... Not just a sacking, by the way, of Angela Rayner as party chair, but extensive briefings against her, very negative and hostile briefings against her. What's your reaction to that? I was just outraged, if I'm totally honest um, with you, Owen, Um, given that her position in the party as um, the chair, I... um, was disgusted in terms of how Kia treated her. You know, he'd come out to say how he was going to take full responsibility for what happened in the elections. And he took this cowardly way out of throwing Angela under the bus. But let's not forget, you know, he has a history of throwing working class Northern women under the bus. You know, um, Becky Long Bailey is another example. And I think it was just despicable how um, so-called colleagues would be um, challenging Angela and posting negative things about her. I think, you know, Kia and Lotto need to take responsibility for what happened, you know, in Hartlepool particularly, you know, because as we know, there were issues from the very beginning with Hartlepool in terms of the selection process, uh, um, and Paul Williams being the only um, candidate put forward. And I think that didn't go down too well. And the fact that um, it just lacked um, strategy, you know, and policy. And I think, you know, we have suffered as a result of that. I mean, it's interesting. I was up in Hartlepool and interviewed uh, Paul Williams, the Labour candidate. I asked him, I think what you'd, you'd expect to be the most basic fundamental question of all, what's Labour's vision for the country? And he couldn't answer it. And I'd say that's not his fault. He got ripped on social media for it. But, I mean, what do you think about that? They're just, in these elections, what was the Labour message? What was the Labour vision? Because, I I, I mean, personally, I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. And I think you're quite right in raising that as an issue, Owen, because, you know, from my point of view, there has been a lack of strategy, you know, from the National Party. And I actually raised that issue directly with Kia at um, a recent PLP meeting to say that, you know, we need to be clear as a party what we stand for and we don't at the moment. However, if you look at um, the successes that we've had um, across the country, you know, particularly in Liverpool, Greater Manchester, London, Wales, you know, why they um, were so successful and had a resounding success was because they were very clear. They took policies and strategy to um, their constituents, to their electric, and, you know, they were very clear about what they wanted, you know, in terms of a post-COVID recovery you know, um, council housing, you know, uh, living wage and all those positive aspects of Labour and our former manifesto pledges. That's why I think that we did so well in those other areas, um, Owen, if I'm totally honest with you. And the fact that um, we've had, you know, some significant losses across the country is because, you know, people are not clear about what Labour stands for at the moment. And we need, you know, to um, be very clear about what we need to do. You know, and and, um, Lotto and leadership talking now about undertaking 
another root and branch review about why failed. You know, they did that in 2019 after the general election. You know, what happened as a result of that? They identified failures at the head of the Labour Party. And in terms of you know, far too many key um, um, high ranking officers, you know, that has that been dealt with? I doubt it. You know, and at a time that we needed local community organisers, you know, the party thought it was a great idea not to renew, uh, renew their contracts and, you know, terminate them. And we needed those organisers in those areas that we needed to push our message. And that didn't happen, unfortunately. What do you think about the fact that Peter Mandelson, I keep saying this, but just just to repeat for your benefit, I, I, I've been told that shadow cabinet ministers who complained about the lines given to them uh, yeah. to to go to the media were told they'd been signed off personally by Peter Mandelson, who's now calling, well, for a purge of the left. He's calling for what he calls, you know, left wing groups associated with the trade unions to be driven out of the party. What what do, what do you think that means, and what could what what do you think the less response to that approach should be? Well, I think, you know, I'd reiterate what um, John Trickett just said, you know, it's unacceptable. And as I mentioned in my tweet, I would, you know, he's advising the party in Hartlepool. And, you know, it was a catastrophic um, failure, you know, so why is he not taking some responsibility for his own actions? You know, and I, and I do believe I'm a member of um, Socialist Campaign Group, and I, and I do believe that we need to be um, pulling together and being an effective opposition, you know, and we need to be looking at the um, the successes of, you know, Liverpool, London, Manchester, okay. Wales, you know, what went well, and we need to be looking at those positive aspects that we can roll out uh, across the country. You know, you know our party um, was developed and grew as a result of the trade union movement, and we need that strength and that support, particularly now in terms of the attacks on, on workers and workers' rights. We've seen what's happened in terms of fire and rehire. I was very disappointed in the, you know, the, the perceived lack of support from the terms of challenging some of that. You know, the only person from my point of view that made um, a clear stance about it was um, Andy MacDonald. You know, these are, you know, um, attacks on workers' rights. And the fact that GMB gas engineers were sacked for refusing to sign a contract that meant that they worked more and got paid less. You know, and from my point of view, that was just a, going to be a domino effect. You know, the, the government, you know, the employers are going to come after our workers' rights. And we need to be a strong opposition and we need to be um, being very clear about how we stand and support our workers and our members going forward. But just just quickly, finally, what where do you think this ends? Do you think a leadership, a full-blown leadership crisis is on the cards? Well, you know, people will say, um, Owen, that um, we haven't given um, Kia enough time. He's been the leader for um, just over 12 months now. And, and I've just heard that there's going to be a reshuffle. You know, from my point of view, is that just papering over the cracks? You know, we need, you know, to, to look at why it went wrong. And as a new MP, as you mentioned, you know, I have a um, lot of issues about the fact that we, as MPs, don't get involved in talking about policies on an ongoing basis. We might have a PLP meeting um, every Monday, but as parliamentarians, we don't have those opportunities to debate and discuss the big issues that are affecting, you know, um, our most deprived communities, you know, where we should be standing uh, up for workers and um, the most disadvantaged. And I think, you know, a leadership election, um, a leadership channeled might be something, you know, um, that might be coming forward. But I think we need to look at how we, as a party, start unifying because, you know, you mentioned that that was one of uh, Keir's um, mandate, one of his um, key pledges when he became the leader. And he has rolled back on so many things, you know. So we're talking about unity. Let's do it, you know, because actions do speak louder than words. So, and, you know, and throwing Andrew Rayner under the bus, from my point of view, is not about creating unity. 
Kim, really, really appreciate that. Very eloquent, very clear and very forthright. Just what we needed to hear. So thank you so much for joining us. And oh. I will no doubt speak to you. Enjoy the Sunday. I don't know. Is it? What's the weather like in Liverpool? It's very grey. It looks like it might be a downpour. Another major downpour, Owen. You know, rain, but hey. But it was well, really lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for inviting Mom to the show. It's an honour. Enjoy your day. It's thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. So we're very, very honoured to be joined now by, I think, one of the stars, it's fair to say, the of of, of the left, the rising stars of, of the left. So I'm very much tipped to have a very, very bright future indeed. It's, of course, the wonderful Nadia Whittam, MP, of course, in Nottingham. Great to see you, Nadia. How are you doing? Hi, Owen. Thanks so much for having me on. It's good to see you as well. Great to see you. OK, I want your reaction first to Angela Rayner. What's, what's your take on that? This is, this is just despicable. There's no one person to blame for the catastrophic results that we saw this week. But if there is, it's certainly not Angela Rayner. And this is a gross abdication of responsibility by the leadership. It's not the fault of the left that we, we saw these terrible results. It's the fact that we failed to give people something to vote for. We failed to hold the government to account. We've seen, you know, in this past year, a litany of corruption, and let's call it what it is, corruption by this government. 150,000 people dead, avoidably, a real terms pay cut for the public sector. I mean, I can tell you, Owen, from the front line, when I returned as a care worker, just how much this government has failed us. But the leadership didn't tell people that on the doorsteps. Um, I mean, my generation, We've grown up under austerity. We are sick to the back teeth of low wage, precarious work, of spending most of our wages on rent. And the lessons that the leadership should have learned rather than firing people is that our offer to the country needs to be one of economic transformation that's driven by a Green New Deal. You know, people want to know exactly how their lives will improve from day one with Labour, exactly how they'll be empowered. So take, for example, in 2019, we had an incredibly detailed, incredible manifesto. We said that we would bring a thousand jobs to Redcar with a recycled steel plant. That is the kind of detail that we need from the current leadership. Why do you think they're failing to offer that vision? I mean, I suppose the question is, when they... In the leadership contest, they offered, you know, I keep going over it, but it was, you know, very clear, I would say, very clear political uh, program. It was the, ten, the so called 10 pledges to maintain the key popular domestic policies, uh, which all the polling shows. And indeed, the Tories are trying to raid often more the rhetoric than the substance, but nonetheless, um, as well as unity, professionalism, electability. I'm not looking hugely electable. I mean, did they mean it or was it simply a ruse to win a membership they knew were significantly to their left? And if they hadn't have done so, then they would have they would have lost as Liz Kendall, the Blairite candidate did in 2015, which some of them not just voted for, but campaigned for. Well, as you've highlighted, one thing has been promised, the radical politics with the competence and the opposite has been delivered. We've shifted to the right on policy. We've lurched into social conservatism with flag waving and attacks on on so-called wokeness and the results that we've seen this week have seriously called into question competence um when we look at the areas that did do well it was with politicians that really embodied hope for their communities and resistance against the injustice that we've been experiencing, not just over the last year, but the last decade and before that. When we look at Andy Burnham in Manchester and how he delivered a trouncing victory, yet Sadiq Khan limped home in London, that's because Andy offered something and Sadiq didn't. Um, Peter Manderson, who, as I keep saying, I mean, he's clearly now got a very, very powerful position within the Labour Party in 2021, the year of our Lord. Astonishing, really. But he, I mean, he's now openly briefing, calling for a purge of the left. That's what he's arguing for. He's clearly calling for 
Uh, I mean, he says left groups linked to trade unions to be expelled, so-called party reform to be one of the priorities of Keir Starmer. He's clearly calling for an all-out assault on the left within the Labour Party. That includes you, Nadia. You are you are clearly very much associated with the left uh, of the Labour Party. I suppose also includes myself. What do you think that means in practice? Do you think they'll be able to to do it? I don't know what that would look like in practice, and and how could that be resisted? Left wing MPs and particularly my generation, we are not going to allow the Labour Party, the the only force for the, the only parliamentary force for social change to be catapulted into oblivion and to be to be made a, a vacuum of hope and policy. That's not going to happen. We need to be resisting the government's attacks on working class communities, on the right to protest, on trade unions, on movements like Black Lives Matter. And we should be instrumental in building up those movements and empowering them. We're not going to be purged by Peter Mandelson. Um, and we're not going to we're not going to get back into our box. When you look around us at some of the huge social movements that have taken place over the last year, the last five years, the last ten even, from the um anti fees protests in 20 10 and 2011, to Black Lives Matter, to climate strikers, young people are not going to be shot up. I mean, on that, but just a couple of other things, because I know you're very busy um, as an MP, a diligent MP in your constituency. But one one of the, you know, we talk, you know, politicos like you and me, we talk about left and right, as you know, better than the vast majority of people, that's not how voters think when you knock on doors people aren't thinking about left or right they're thinking about visions they're thinking about how things relate to their everyday lives is a political party offering something that resonates with them um and their experiences and i suppose the issue is actually that point you make about the generational point which is in this country it's just a fact it's a big challenge for labor because the over the older voters are where labor's really struggling who are just and i don't like generational politics just an observation of fact older people who tend to be homeowners uh, who tend, according to all the polling, to be more socially conservative in their outlook, um, have very much en masse support the Conservatives in higher numbers than ever. Um, and we can see in seats with older populations and high levels of home ownership, including in, in areas just described as obviously working class communities. That's where the Tories are doing very well. Whilst younger people under the age of, say, 40, to be generous, so it can include me, uh, no, but people, young people under the age of 40, younger people under the age of 40, who would tend to be private renters, insecure work, living standards being slashed, face the brunt of their public services being cut, tend to be socially progressive on, you know, isn't that the danger that Labour, in the way Peter Mandelson once said that the working class have nowhere else to go, uh, which was hubristic, that they're thinking the Labour leadership, those people under the four, under the age of 40, they don't have anywhere else to go. If you look at Bristol's mayoral elections where the Greens surged and came second, Labour defeated the Greens in a runoff in Bristol, that obviously suggests otherwise, and we've seen what's happened in Scotland. Um, but isn't that, the de isn't that, you know, do you think the Labour leadership, just that they're just thinking, well, the under 40s, we've got them in the bag. We don't need to win those people over, and therefore we can afford to alienate the sorts of politics that resonate with them most. It would be wild if the leadership did think that, because the opposite is clearly true. I mean, clearly many working class communities are divided, and we need to reach across that divide, but we do that by offering people hope and offering a bold, transformative policy agenda that would would make clear exactly what would change in their communities and how their lives would improve. As I said, from, from day one, like the 1,000 jobs in Redcar with a recycled steel plant, um, you know, waving flags, attacking migrants, bashing the poor, just doesn't do that. We're never going to out-Tory the Tories on that, and we shouldn't be trying to. And when we do, we just feed their rhetoric whilst at the same time alienating our base. The Tories would, I mean, any other political party wouldn't dare to speak about their their base in such such insulting terms. Um, and this should absolutely be a lesson to us not to take those votes for granted. Lastly, where do you, where do you think things are heading next? Is the leadership heading for a full blown leadership 
crisis? Well, I think, as I said earlier, Keir stood on a platform of radical policy with competence. The opposite is being delivered. And rightly, members feel angry about that. As to whether Keir needs to go, I think depends on what he does next. But the the chaos and infighting that has been initiated by decisions that have been made in the last 24 hours are completely unnecessary. They don't bode well. Um, I'm open to, to being persuaded that, that Keir can offer something credible and unifying, but I do need to be convinced. I think like a lot of MPs, I'm in wait and see mode. Nadia, really, really appreciate you coming on as ever at such short notice uh, with your brilliant and much needed insights. Uh, so thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you IRL soon. Thanks very much, Aaron. Take care. Take care, Nadia. Lots of love. Uh, so finally, we've got, I mean, as I've said, it really has been a, a really stellar lineup. And I think one of the, you know, looking at the election results, clearly for Labour, some of them would be appalling in much of England, in obviously in in Hartlepool, um, in Scotland, Labour have gone backwards. Slightly peculiar to watch Anna Sawar on national television grinning like a Cheshire cat as though he's uh, made some sort of breakthrough. Labour have their lowest vote share in seats in Holyrood in Scotland in the history of devolution. So it's not looking good, is it? Um, and clearly Labour have lost council seats across the country, but that's not actually universally the case, as we've many of the guests have emphasised. In various areas, Labour have gone have have done well they've advanced even um and these are areas where you have politicians who i suppose take andy burnham andy burnham's not traditionally associated with the labor left um but he was someone who has shown a willingness to fight the conservatives uh that's what he obviously very famously did that's why he became known as king of the north uh he's brought buses into public ownership uh, as part of a integrated uh, public transport system. So he's actually delivering things which people think to themselves, this makes me want to vote for him. And that's why he increased his vote share uh, on an increased turnout. Uh, and we've seen that in other communities in London, uh, sorry, in, in, in Britain is uh, across England as well. You've seen where, you know, people associated with an alternative. Another example in Salford, uh, who's newly elected mayor and a higher majority, Paul Dennett talked about the lessons about and, and how the Labour leadership was failing to listen. And another example, and it's a very striking example, is Preston. Uh, and in Preston, the so-called Preston model, which we're going to talk about, has been a hugely successful, innovative model implemented by the Labour Council, which has infused people to vote for them. And we are very lucky to have with us someone who bucked the national trend. And I should just, before I bring him in, I will ask him this. Keir Starmer hasn't actually gone out, as you would expect, and gone out... And, and and celebrated the success stories. He hasn't gone to these communities and gone, this shows what Labour can do. Labour, you know, it's a challenging uh, week for Labour, but here's examples of where it's working. He hasn't extolled Preston. He hasn't extolled even Andy Burton. He's not extolled anyone. Uh, instead, he's uh, said that Labour needs to stop looking inwards and then sacked his deputy. Astonishing. But anyway, we're going to bring in Matthew Brown, who's the leader of Preston City Council, a, a massive congratulations, of course, to you, Matthew, because, as I said, you did box the national trend. Uh, what I want to ask you is, tell me about the Preston model. A lot of people might have heard of it, or they might not have heard of it. What is the Preston model that your local Labour Party has developed? Yeah, hi, Owen. Good to see you again. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, can hear you very well. Congratulations and great, great to see you. Yeah, fantastic. No, I mean, it's uh, it's trying to uh, build a more resilient and democratic economy. So it's about the council doing things a lot more in the community. So it leads the way in terms of paying the real living wage. It tries to buy from locally based companies, but crucially as well, get the big institutions in the community, hospitals, universities to do the same. And now we're getting to the quite radical part of it. Where we're trying to you know, establish our own bank. We're trying to establish worker own cooperatives. We've got a number already. We're going to build a, a, a cinema that's going to be in the city centre, that's going to be the ownership of the city, so it's going to be public ownership. The profits go back to the community. So it's trying to put that democracy, economic democracy, in Preston. And it's a movement now that's uh, taking hold in many places across the country. But crucially, 
a lot of quite radicalised American cities like New York and Chicago, they're saying we want to have a community wealth building uh, set of ideas as well. So you've got this international movement, especially with Biden becoming president, that we can actually grow on really. And it's a bit disappointing that maybe the Labour leadership didn't say a little bit more about it really. What what kind of a response did you get on the doorstep in Preston? What what were people saying? Because you, you booked the trend, as I said, some really pretty shocking results in many parts of England. And a lot of your fellow councillors have lost their seats and you, you clearly haven't. So what, what was the sort of feedback you were getting, um, which you think contrasts with what maybe was heard in other parts of the country? Uh, well, I mean, we've still got serious challenges in our community, aren't we? And obviously, there's been decades of austerity, deindustrialization, neoliberal economics. So there's naturally still that cynicism when you when you're canvassing and knocking on doors. But what people do see in Preston is they see a, a city centre that's been regenerated. They see lots of living wage jobs. They see a council that's tackling racism and, and discrimination. They see us organising a community food hubs and that's something we actually did before the pandemic to feed hungry kids and you know the profile we got with having this alternative it's really big so people see in the media that we're actually trying something different and it does resonate people do actually say you know we know we know you're trying as a Labour council and we're going to give you support because of that and you know we didn't out of all the councils in Lancashire Preston didn't lose one single Labour Council and the rest did and I don't take any pride in that because it's devastating every loss of a colleague is devastating but I just think this isn't about personalities it's about ideas and winning power to then transform your local community and that's what it's got to be about what what do you what thoughts do you have on the Labour leadership's current strategy and where it led last week I think in the last few decades there's been a situation where politics has changed fundamentally. So we've had the 2007-8 economic crash. That then led to austerity. We then had Brexit. So, you know, in working class communities, there are cries for help that they want things to change. And I think just going back to some kind of managerial approach, it's not going to cut it. And sadly, I think the Tories and potentially others on the right are going to challenge that. So, for me, it's never been about personalities. It's not about Keir Starmer, Jeremy Corbyn. It's about the policies and the economic policies that we're pursuing. And I think that was pursued by John McDonnell before. Obviously, very popular because people do want to see a higher living wage. They do want to see social care workers paid a real living wage as well. They do want to see you know, utilities back in public ownership. They do want to see workers having more involvement in companies. And it's really trying to appeal to that. And it's very common sense. There's nothing scary about it. And I think if we get back to that uh, and take the personalities out of it, I think we're going to be very successful, both locally and nationally. Finally, what would your advice be? And you are in a position to offer advice to the Labour leadership. If the Labour leadership wants to do well, it wants to succeed, the whole point of the Labour Party, of course, is to defeat the Conservatives and to be in a position of gaining political power so it can implement policies that transform the lives of people it exists to represent, which is what you're doing in Preston. So clearly, the Labour leadership needs to be listening to evidence base, what works. You know, if it's going to be pragmatic, that's what it needs to do. Uh, so it's not an ideological point. It's just pragmatically, why is it working, Preston? So what advice would you be giving to the Labour leadership now about the strategy it needs to pursue in the coming days and weeks? I just think we've really got to appeal to, 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 to you know, to the kind of the communities who are suffering from that inequality. And that, that, ex that extends to middle class communities as well. They're suffering a lot with austerity, pay freezes and tuition fees for the kids and other things. And I think we've just got to try and win that battle of ideas. That's what it's about. And I think these policies that we're, that we're applying locally, and there's many, dozens of councils, mayors on community wealth building now. I do think the leadership should listen to it, to be honest. And I think, I mean, elements of, the, of it are, and I know Ed Miliband's showing lots of support for it, as is Jonathan Reynolds. It's not necessarily a left and right thing, but, you know, it would be good if, you know, an Angela Rayner came to our launch event as well. But I just think we probably need to say, that people want to have change and that change is going to be coming both locally and nationally. And if we're just skirting around the edges, it's not going to cut it. We're not going to be successful, sadly. So, you know, I'm open to have a conversation with anyone because my belief is these policies will really, you know, try and get people into decent jobs, tackle poverty and deprivation. And that's what we're all about. 
Matthew, really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and insight, not least given it's based on on on, on where Labour has actually managed to defy the local trend. So if anyone's interested in a Labour party which can actually do things with political power, then of course, here is a case to do that people should listen to. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, congratulations, and I'll, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Rod. Thank you so much, Owen. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh, wow, what a show. Uh, this is, I mean, it is a moment of profound crisis for the Labour Party um, in terms of what happens next. I mean, before we wrap up, I'm just going to go through some super chats, which people have sent through, and I'm going to thank people uh, as, as I go along. Uh, Peter O'Donovan, do you think Angela Rayner was always going to get the chop at some point, which we discussed earlier? Thank you, Chris O'Brien. Uh, people have argued, suspiciously from the right of the party, for reforming Labour from scratch to be more relevant in the 20th, 21st century. What do you think? By the way, the left should be arguing for that. And actually, uh, you know, if we look at the Corbyn period, there were things that went wrong which need to be learned from. Equally, many things that were clearly got right. And one of them was the social media strategy. I mean, you know, in the 2017 election, that was a huge triumph. Facebook, Twitter, uh, it, you know, in, in alliance with the likes of Momentum, it was apparently about one in four voters in the country saw a Momentum video at some point. And those reached a lot of voters who aren't, in, you know, they're not watching Question Time or Channel 4 News or the Sunday morning shows. Uh, but they did see those videos on Facebook, very high engagement. That's an example. You know, how do you involve uh, members democratically within their party? How do you, you know, one of the other things that Labour did try to pioneer was, uh, under the previous leadership, was community organising. The idea that the Labour Party isn't just, you know, occasionally knocks on doors uh, come elections, but actually has a permanent entrenched presence within communities, showing the Labour Party actually doing things to help people, whether they're in power or not. You know, those are the sorts of things that Labour should be building on. Unfortunately, Keir Starmer's leadership shut down the community organising uh, unit. So I think in terms of reforming the Labour Party, I'm afraid what the likes of Peter Mandelson mean is shut down all democracy, purge the left and have the Labour Party run by wonks from, uh, you know, special advisors and people who works as private lobbyists running the Labour Party. It will just be run by the sorts of people who... Uh, you know, uh, work for private consultants and management companies. I mean, how do you win over communities or even understand what communities want on that basis? Astonishing. Uh, Rich Williamson, uh, thanks for your support. Starmer out, you say. Uh, and a lot of that here today, to be fair. Gideon Mack, another election where just over a third rights of the right wing and ends up winning a landslide. Time for Labour to back PR. I actually do support proportional representation, but I would just bear in mind that Labour has to win under the existing electoral system first past the post before it can even think about doing that. And often it's true that electoral reform becomes a, a show of, again, it's not wrong in of itself, as I've just said, but it, it can sound a bit like we're not winning under the current system, so we need to change it. But that almost concedes defeat anyway, because you're saying I can't, we can't stitch together. Uh, so I would bear that in mind, but I do think on its own merits, it's something Labour should support. Uh, David Yates is Labour success, just the trend of their votes piling up in young liberal metropolitan areas and falling away in older working areas has been for ages. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't frame it in the way you did, because I think there's often this sense that uh, younger people and working class people are separate, discrete categories when they're not. Obviously, younger people in this country, whether the half who go to university uh, and get saddled with debt or not, uh, they're people often in precarious and low paid jobs. They don't have capital. Home ownership's been in collapse for younger people for a very long time. They're often in an unregulated private rented sector. They often depend on social security that's been cut back. Their youth services when they were younger were decimated. Public services they depend on have been uh, slashed back as well. Their living standards overall are significantly lower than they were before the 2008 financial crash. Um, and, you know, I mean, even if you take London, you know, London's often caricatured as this den of you know, of, of of the liberal bourgeoisie. And it is absolutely true that London, of course, has huge amounts of wealth concentrated in various pockets, but it also has some of the worst poverty in the country. You know, I'm in Islington now, which is always caricature, it is champagne, socialist territory. F four in 10 children grew up in poverty in Islington. And if you look at Hackney and elsewhere, again, some of the high, you know, they're in the top 10 for child poverty in, in the country. What is happening is, in places like Hartlepool, it's very clear, is, we don't have the latest census figures. We obviously all filled them in, but they haven't been processed. Uh, but we do have the figures from previous censuses. And what happened in Hartlepool is a case in point. Between 1981 and 2011, 
the, the percentage of people uh, under the age of 25 fell by a quarter and the number of people over the age of 65 went up by a quarter. And, you know, I think a lot of the time, you know, there's a slightly patronizing assumption that anyone with a regional accent who's of a certain age who expresses socially conservative views, that's the working class and nobody else. Um, and, it, you know, many of those voters own their own homes um, and have socially conservative views. And it's very hard or challenging whoever's leading the Labour Party to win them over, especially when the Tories have abandoned austerity in favour of very targeted spending, particularly in communities they've won or seek to win over. And those younger people are leaving those communities often because there isn't the work for them there. And they take their Labour votes because actually the evidence shows younger people from those so-called Red Wall seats vote Labour in higher numbers than they've ever voted Labour in the history of democracy. But they're taking those Labour votes to urban areas where Labour already have uh, big majorities, uh, including area, you know, seats that have shifted over to the Labour Party uh, in recent years. Uh, and that's a huge challenge, you know, because Labour does at the moment depend absolutely on people under the age of 40 who are economically precarious and socially progressive, whilst the Tories depend on people who have economic security to a much higher degree, not just home ownership, the triple lock in pension, which is something we should all defend, uh, as well as having more socially conservative views and a whole range of issues. That's very challenging and difficult. And Labour, under any iteration, any of its leaderships has not come up from left or right, any convincing explanation for that. I think the danger is at the moment is Keir Starmer's team, they're not winning over those other voters, not winning over older socially conservative voters. And they're they're using focus groups to repeat back sound bites they get without constructing their own narrative or vision. Unlike the Tories, who, you know, in the financial crash would have had voters and focus groups saying, don't play politics. But then the Tories said, I think we will. And what they said instead was, well, actually, Labour spent too much money um, and didn't fix the roof when the sun was shining. And then, wo wo you know, lo and behold, focus groups were repeating about those Tory messages, which were repeated with iron discipline. Labour haven't done that during the pandemic. They haven't told a story about why it was one of the worst disasters on earth, uh, allowing the Tories to get away with it and make people think Labour wouldn't have done any better. And, and I think, you know, they haven't won over those older voters, but they're in very serious danger of repelling younger people who won't come out and vote or, as they've done in many places in the country, gone for the Green Party instead. And if they want to wage a war on the left, they're going to drive those voters away even more. Uh, you know, forget about the left, right, internal Labour Party stuff. Think about what it means for people in the country who actually, whatever failings of the previous leadership... Uh, and there were, you know, I wrote a whole book about that. Um, but whatever those failings obviously did attract in very, very big numbers, younger people, uh, because it accorded with their sense of economic insecurity uh, and, and provided answers. And if Labour turned their back on that, then those younger people will go. Right. I'll quickly carry on, uh, go through these finally so I can let you all enjoy your Sundays or whenever you're listening. Uh, the Sean Thomas, uh, ideas of the left are now most dangerous to the right. Historically, radicalism has been systematically crushed. Working classes are stuck in Stockholm. I think you mean Stockholm syndrome. Well, obviously, working class people aren't homogenous. And in 2017, for example, uh, the working age population, including both full-time and part-time workers and unemployed people, Labour won in every single category. It was pensioners where Labour didn't win. So I think it's important to, to recognise that. Lots of working class people do vote for the Labour Party. And uh, younger working class people overwhelmingly vote for the Labour Party. The Labour Party isn't just one thing. Uh, sorry, well, the working class isn't just one thing. It's not just people who are white. It's not just people who are older. It's not just people who are men. It's not just people who are straight. It's obviously a rainbow. And uh, Labour needs to build as broad a coalition as possible of working class people. That's not easy uh, because to be working class is not to be homogenous. But it's something obviously worth thinking about. Uh, fridge freezer, is it too late to sign up in the assumed upcoming leadership election? If a leadership election is now going to happen, then no. They may well try and stitch up the rules. I wouldn't put it past them. Um, they might try. And, I mean, that's a genuine issue. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're currently in their panic thinking of how they stop uh, in a leadership contest, the left getting on the ballot paper. Peter O'Donovan, does Starmer need to set out an, an hour-long press briefing to set out the manifesto and vision and not obsessed with Corbyn? He certainly should do the latter. I think setting out a vision, he doesn't need to do a manifesto yet. It's not an election. Setting out a vision. What is your vision for the country you seek to lead? What do you want to do with political power? Because at the moment, no one can answer that. I can't get Labour MPs to answer that, including those who supported Keir Starmer. I couldn't get Hartlepool's Labour candidate to answer that question. How do you get people to vote for you if you don't offer that vision? People, I'll vote for the Labour Party, come what may. 
it's in my blood. I'm just a, I'm a loyal Labour man. Guilty. But that's not the case for most people. You have to give them something to vote for. And if Labour don't, I think the problem is the Labour right don't have a vision at all. Um, you know, in, in the 1990s, New Labour, in a period of financialized growth, did have a vision and a mess message. I didn't agree with it, but it was it, it was coherent and consistent with the age in which uh, in which people lived. Um, you know, take the proceeds of financial growth and put them in public services, basically. Um, I, the financial bubble popped. That vision is now irrelevant. It's a period of crisis, has been for a long time. And back then they did have dividing lines, minimum wage, with full tax and privatised utilities, gay rights, devolution. What dividing lines do they have for the Tories now? I'm afraid they're actually to the right, a lot of them, of the Conservatives. They oppose increasing corporation tax, which the Tories are clearly now doing. That's what we're talking about. Uh, they don't believe in state intervention. They focus instead on fiscal responsibility, which the Tories aren't doing. They're stuck in a pre-2015 time war. So they don't have a vision that's distinct from what the Tories are doing. So I don't know what they're supposed to offer. Uh, Rue Phoenix, Keir Starmer threw his credibility away when he spent his energy attacking socialists. It would be nice, wouldn't it, if, as John Trickett noted, they focused on, on the Tories. They're not even calling for resignations of government ministers. And again, actually, do you know what? Going back to New Labour, I'm not a player, right? Although I do sometimes get called that um, by some of the more imaginative people on Twitter. I'm a socialist. Um, but actually, I think actually Alistair Campbell and Tony Blair would have ripped, you know, they, they didn't offer the radical alternative I wanted in the 90s, but they did gun for the Tories. They did go for them. Very, like, no, no holds barred. They were very effective. Alistair Campbell was always like, how do you rip these people apart? Every day, his view was like, how do you, how are we going to eat up three toys for breakfast today? They don't have that killer instinct. They're not doing it. Um, it said, yeah, the left. Marty, we need Andy Burnham parachuting into a safe seat and leadership challenge launched against Starmer. Burnham is uh, Labour's own ho only hope. He hasn't ruled that out. Be interested to see where Andy Burnham stands politically at the moment. He made clear his disquiet over Angie Rayner's uh, being sacked. Uh, uh his attitude beat. I follow the Labour Party YouTube channel. The last video they uploaded was a month ago. <laughs> Not the most active presence. Darren Alavi, please reach out to George Galloway. He's one of the few men who should be listened to in Brexit and give the workers' parties and coverage, please. I would prefer to set my face on fire than do any of those things. George Galloway is a charlatan who voted for the Conservatives. Uh, his uh, Twitter feed is just full of gutter, right-wing populist nonsense these days, uh, as well as saying terrible things about trans people. Um, no, he's not socialist. He's not on the left. He's a charlatan. Um, that's the last thing I'm ever going to say about George Galloway. Great. Craig Berkey, the unions need to stop funding the Labour Party and the campaign group need to resign and sit independently. I'm going to put a grand on the Tory majority because Starmer is electorally inept. The electoral system we have doesn't allow that to happen. Uh, it would split the vote and they wouldn't be elected. Probably Tories in their present in their in 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 their place. I think instead the campaign group should have a unified strategy. That's the left of the parliamentary Labour Party. For those who don't know, um, and the unions should use their their member subs, their financial muscle, to put pressure on the Labour leadership. The unions shouldn't just give money and blank checks. You know, the the Labour Party was founded to represent the unions and give them a voice, working people a voice. If they don't do that, then the unions should say, well, why should we just hand you cash for nothing? Um, uh, Nick Gossett, is it conceivable the purge is to get Murdoch on side? I mean, I'm sure they might be thinking about that, but I don't think they'll, they'll ever get Murdoch on side, actually. I don't think Rupert, I don't think the Murdoch Empire has any reason uh, to abandon the Conservatives at the moment. If they're trying to be the more responsible party of capital, I don't think capital is interested at the moment. Craig Berkey, the Labour Party is a cage for the left. Soon it's dead the better. We need a modern socialist party with open selection in favour of PR. But again, you can't get to that stage without proportional representation. We don't have it. That's why every left party has so far failed. Uh, C. Clive Lewis for leader, a left adjacent army veteran of colour, fantastic communicator, real human being, hard for the right media to attack. Also, Becky long is deputy and McDonald back as shadow chancellor. So people are obviously talking about their various candidates. Uh, I have to say, I was speaking to a shadow minister last week who's not on the left, who said, why the hell hasn't Keir Starmer brought John McDonnell back in? He's got the brain the size of a universe, uh, which is true. John McDonnell, I think, is head and shoulders ahead of almost anyone in the Parliamentary Labour Party. Uh, I did back him for leader three times, four times, arguably. I always thought he would have been a great leader myself. Uh, thanks to Dara M, happy squirrel, 24-year-old Labour member, voted for Keir, gave him the benefit of the doubt until recently. Totally feel, uh, I feel totally misled by his 2020 platform. Don't beat yourself up. It's not your fault. Uh, they lied through their teeth. 
Why why would you why not accept in good faith what they were telling you? You know, and it was a shattering defeat 2019, really shattering. And uh, you know, we all just thought to ourselves, we want to move on and get rid of the Tories. And someone saying, you can keep the principles you want, but we'll be electable. Very, very appealing program, but they just didn't stick to it. They're not electable or print. It's the worst of both worlds. Not electable, not principled. Nothing left. What's the point? What is the because you know, with Jeremy Corbyn. You know, and obviously it did not end well in the end. 2017, Labour did come close to power. I like the way everyone's airbrushed that out of history. Uh, but, you know, at least people can say, well, he's got principles. He believes in something. If you end up leading the Labour Party to electoral ruin and you don't even have any principles, who's your base? What's the po You know, what is the point of that political project? Um, so don't beat yourself up. You were lied to. You were. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, a, 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 a political project based on a political fraud is doomed. And that's not your fault. That's their fault. Uh, Paul Smith, I'm happy to hear what Manderson has to say from the dock at The Hague. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, I mean, I presume you're talking about the Iraq war. I'm not sure what Peter Manderson's role in that was. But nonetheless, Peter Manderson's uh, senior position within the Labour Party, his resurrection, a man who, you know, again, if you go back to the 90s, I didn't, I'm not someone who supports the New Labour project, but it made sense in that political age. Hiring Peter Mandelson, even on its own terms, is like Tony Blair hiring Jim, uh, Harold Wilson's main advisor from 1974. I mean, in 1997, that it would have been like that. It would have been literally like getting, oh, Harold Wilson's been, but obviously in the 90s, people are like, well, there's the 70s, it's a different age. But that's what they're doing. And it's desperation. They're just thinking to themselves, Peter Mandelson has some magic dust from Labour succeeding in the past. Uh, we'll sprinkle that on. Uh, he's telling us to purge the left and attack the left, plunge the Labour Party into civil war, which will be a horrible, bloody affair, which will uh, mean Labour's ratings collapse even further and make Keir Starmer look like a, a total liar. Genius strategy, guys. You really are the grown-ups in the room, aren't you? Well played. Um, I think we'll end it there. Um, we, uh, for those supporting us on Patreon, thank you very much. Patreon.com forward slash ownjoes84. You're funding our documentaries like in Hartlepool. We've got some great documentaries coming up just like that. Uh, and on Patreon, you can help decide what those documentaries will be and who we talk to. We've got some great interviews lined up uh, in the coming days. We've got lots of shows on the Labour Party, but also, of course, the Tories. Whatever people say, most of my output is focused on the Conservatives and exposing them. We do have to talk about the uh, the opposition shooting themselves in the head, unfortunately. We wouldn't have to talk about it if they didn't do it. Do you know what I mean? It's not my, it's not the fault of the people pointing out the problems. It's the problems that are the problem. Not the most eloquent sentence I've constructed, but you get the gist. Really appreciate everyone who supported the show. Thank you so much. Do press like. If you press like, it helps the algorithm. More people watch this and subscribe. The podcast, do download the podcast. Give us five stars on that if you feel so obliging and a review and that will encourage other people to uh, listen we'll be live uh next sunday at 12 o'clock we may be live during the week depending on the events and we'll have lots of news including inside stuff about what's happening in the labor party thanks so much for our guest today thank you so much for you i hope you're all doing well uh as we struggle through this terrible national emergency um take care lots of love speak soon